Welcome to the Aristotle Lecture, and this will be the third installment and final for this class of the Greek ancient Greek philosophy. Um, so I'll talk more about Aristotle soon. Uh, let me get right into the major ideas we're going to discuss. I'll let's say one thing. Um, try to pay attention to the connections, and I'll draw your attention to them as well. But see the connections and the response that er the way that Aristotle was responding to Plato's theory of dualism. So, in a sense, we're kind of going from relativism from the Sophist to um, the dualism of Plato as a response to relativism to this theory called naturalism, which is a response to dualism. Uh, and more or less what Aristotle is saying is he's saying, look, I don't agree with Plato and I don't agree with the Sophists. He says, I think the Sophists are wrong, that there's no such thing as objective or universal truth. But he says, I also think Plato's wrong, that there's some higher dimension of forms. He's, Aristotle says, where? Show it to me. So for Aristotle, because he was a student of Plato, as I mentioned before, and he had actually studied at Plato's academy, uh, because of that, he knew Plato's philosophy well, and he was often said to be um, Plato's brightest student. And uh, he believed the forms, the theory of forms was somewhat correct, just not correct in the way Plato thought. So basically what Aristotle says is he says, look, there are forms, there are universals, but they're here. They're on the planet Earth. So we don't need to have some higher realm of uh, you know, some higher dimension to have objectivity, to have universality. We can just look to the universal laws in the world around us. So this is why, I hope you can tell from that point there, that this is why some refer to Aristotle as the father of modern science, because he was one of the first to kind of say, we figure out how things work by testing them, by observing the world and drawing arguments from them, by deducing the way the world works from observation. Uh, and that's where the objectivity comes in. If we can observe that in many different places, you know, the same process happens in, you know, I don't know, the production of a plant or, uh, or whatever in nature, then we can say that's a universal thing. This, this happens everywhere. It's not just cultural. It's not just a matter of opinion. So in a way, Plato, sorry, in a way, Aristotle is still responding to relativism. He's saying relativism is false, but he's saying it's false for a different reason than what Plato said. Plato said, there's these universals up in this higher dimension. And Aristotle says, well, no, the universals are here in this dimension, but they're still universals. So it's not relativism. Uh, now, Aristotle is also famous for being one of the first to discuss causality, causal, you know, causes. Why does the, you know, A cause B when the cue ball hits the eight ball, what is projecting the eight ball off into the direction? What forces are at play here? Causality. That hadn't been thought about in too much depth until Aristotle, and he lays down a lot of, um, an entire theory of causality. Now, crucial to Aristotle's philosophy and running through all of it is the concept of purpose. Uh, and there's a, and of course, there's an ology. There's an ology for everything. Um, teleology. Remember, we learned that lo the L-O-G-Y part comes from logos, which means the study of. And telos was a Greek word meaning purpose. So teleology is the study of purpose. So to put it in fancy terms, Aristotle's philosophy is very teleological. Teleological. Um, and so even though he talks about causes, and we'll go through that process, all the causes are leading towards a purpose. So when Aristotle observes nature, he observes a world in which there is purpose everywhere. Everything is moving towards an end or a goal. Everything is becoming something else. Uh, everything is ultimately reaching towards what Aristotle will call its fullest potential. So everything, when I say everything, I mean all living creatures from plants to humans are moving towards a purpose. So for Aristotle, he saw a world filled with meaning and purpose. Now that may seem strange to some of you because naturalism denies the existence of a higher of a higher being. So Aristotle didn't talk about a higher being, but he thought the purpose was in this world. So that raises a big question that we'll talk about later with theology when we talk about God, is the difference between grand purpose and uh, purpose on this earth. 
life, what might be called less, you know, just normal everyday purpose. What are those differences? Uh, and we'll talk about that. Aristotle also has a concept of soul. He saw the different levels of soul in animals um, and plants even. So he sees what's sometimes called a hierarchy, a division of souls where one is higher than the previous and so forth. Um, so that's Aristotle. Now one final thing we'll look at is this concept of eudaimonia, which is sometimes translated as happiness, but that's not really a very good translation. It's really, a better translation would be well-being, maybe. Uh, and what Aristotle is telling us is that, hum because you might wonder, well, you know, the fullest potential, say that the potential of um, uh, a rat, you know, a, a baby rat is just to become a full-grown rat that just goes around and eats trash or whatever and, uh, you know, mates. But what's the full potential of a human? Right? That's a harder question, isn't it? What's the ultimate, if, if everything has purpose and we're all part of everything, we must have purpose too. So what is our purpose as humans? Well, Aristotle creates an entire theory of eudaimonia and he says our purpose is to live fully realized lives, is to find our full absolute potential. And he, of course, acknowledged that there were going to be different ways different people would reach potential, their own potential. But he did say there were actually objective facts that would make it more likely that you'd reach this point of eudaimonia. Um, and it's very different from the temporary concept of happiness we have today. We often think of happiness in terms of like, oh, I felt happy then, right? I was happy at that party. But for Aristotle, he's talking about a deep, lasting, fully realized life. He's not talking about moments of happiness. In fact, counterintuitively, you could be living a fully realized life and you could have moments of sadness. So for Aristotle, it's the whole process that's important. So for example, you might have gone through a terrible, terrible loss, a breakup, a marriage, a divorce, the loss of a loved one, but you became so much stronger that that was part of your journey and you wouldn't change it for anything. Even though you were miserable, you know, for those months or years when you went through it, for Aristotle, that's all part of your process. That's not, that doesn't mean you're unhappy because you went through an unhappy time. So for Aristotle, a fully realized human has to see the long game. Right? You, you can't just look at the immediate way you feel right now. So anyways, let's look at um, Aristotle himself. Like I said, he had studied at the academy. Um, he was a student of Plato's. He was Plato's most brilliant student. And unfortunately, he was actually looked over, uh, you know, for most likely political reasons. He was looked over as the next head of the academy because when Plato died, somebody had to take over. And another guy ended up taking over which, as we'll see, would lead Aristotle to create his own separate school. Um, uh, but anyways, he got kind of snubbed on that. Plato probably wouldn't have wanted that because he Plato did very much uh, see Aristotle as a protege. But after he was dead, he's dead, right? Now, perhaps what's most fascinating about Aristotle is that the the information we have about him from, I mean, his the writings he's he, that we have from him are actually not the main writings he did. It, most of his works are lost to history. Isn't that crazy? As much as we know about Aristotle, most of his works are lost to history. He supposedly wrote like over a hundred um, amazing dialogues similar to Plato. And over the course of different wars and, you know, for instance, the Library of Alexandria, which would be built in Greece later, um, housed a lot of his writings and that was taken over by different factions from you know Muslim leaders to Christian leaders and uh, in the in all the mire you know it was it was destroyed a few times and rebuilt long story short it's lost to history we, we lost his works so how do we know about him then well what did remain consistent what we do have is uh, his notes, what we believe are either his notes about his theories, like just the core bare bones of his theories. They may have been notes that his students took um, from listening to him, like notes you might take in a lecture class. Or they may have been notes like the ones I have here, although much more brilliant than mine. Um, they may have been notes that he used to teach himself. In any case, we can get his full philosophical system from these notes. It's all laid out there. And it's very clear and direct and logical. Um, Aristotle is also often seen as the father of logic, as we'll see, uh, too. So 
his works are lost to history, but we do have um, uh, those notes, and, and those give us a, a general overview. Now, I want to mention something that I highly, highly recommend, and I will actually cite from it in a couple times in this class, and that's a book called Aristotle's Children, written in the early 2000s. Uh, and it's one of the best history, popular history books ever written, in my opinion. And what the author does is he traces back from the beginning of ancient Greek history uh, Aristotle's writings and how much they changed hands and, and um, how different cultures came to them and found them and found value in them. And people often forget this or have not studied it, but um, the, the uh, Muslim cultures actually were greatly responsible for respecting and translating uh, ancient Greek philosophy. Not just Aristotle, but um, uh, Plato and all the others too. They had great respect for Greek philosophy. And later, their translations would get in the hands of Christian theologists in the Middle Ages, and we'll study some of both of these people, Islamic and Christian theologists later. Uh, but they both, the, all of them, were very much respectful of Aristotle and had translated his works, and they're actually the reason we still have them to this day to some extent. Um, now, it's interesting, the reason they translated him, they respected Aristotle, but they disagreed with him. Because you probably recognize that naturalism, the idea of a natural world controlling, you know, being the main source of reality, conflicts with the idea that there's a god or a soul. So even though they respected him, they would often argue against him, but in a respectful way, you know, in a way of, hey, this guy is the man, but I disagree. So anyways, Aristotle had a great influence on especially Islam and Christianity, and if you really want to see the details, check out Aristotle's children uh, to see the great influence that he really has had on our culture. Now, just to contrast him with Plato, I've mentioned several times now, he's the student of Plato, and at a certain point, he started disagreeing with Plato but, you know, just the same way I was just describing the Christian and Muslim philosophers with respect to him, he was the same way with Plato. He said, look, you got a lot of good points, Plato, you're a genius, but I respectfully disagree. And so this famous painting that I'm sure you've seen at some point, whether unconsciously or consciously, this is a famous painting by Raphael called The School of Athens. And the full painting's on the left. And... Um, there are a bunch of famous Greeks sitting around, and so many of the pre-Socratics and some sophists are in there. Uh, and right smack in the middle, though, are the two big ones, and that's Plato on the left and Aristotle on the right. And you can see the, the, um, on the right, the right image there is the center of that picture on the left blown up. And again, that's Plato on the left, Aristotle on the right. Now, what you should pay attention to here to help you understand that where these two guys are coming from is Plato on the left is pointing up. That symbolizes his belief in a higher dimension of forms that we can tap into, as I explained in the last lecture. However, look at Aristotle, because he's looking at Plato and he's going, whoa, dude, keep it on the ground. His hand, he's kind of going like this with his hand, like pushing down. That symbolizes Aristotle's belief in the natural world, that the natural world is the source of meaning and the source of um, knowledge. So huge difference. For Plato, meaning and knowledge come from a higher dimension. For Aristotle, meaning and knowledge come from the world around us. We just have to go take it and find it. Okay, so these are the major differences, the major disagreement between these philosophers. Now, another reason for uh, the proliferation of Aristotle's works and um, Greek philosophy is because Aristotle was actually the tutor of Alexander the Great the great king. So King Philip, Alexander's father, um, uh, eventually hires Aristotle to tutor Alexander. And uh, all throughout his life, Alexander had a great respect for knowledge and wisdom and philosophy as a result of the tutelage of Aristotle. And in fact, Alexander would even, as he went off on conquests, he would bring back specimens from different countries for Aristotle to study because he knew Aristotle was a naturalist who you know, liked to, to see different parts of the natural world. Uh, so that respect was always uh, given. And although Alexander was conquering other nations, he also always had a respect for their philosophy and their culture and tried to allow it to flourish among with Greek philosophy. In any case, you can see from that campaigns of conquest map that that's how Greek philosophy was spread. 
And uh, so, you know, this was several thousand years ago. So that got embedded in the culture. And like I said, it wasn't and later. It was still there as um, the Islamic and Christian theologists were translating it. So I mentioned that Aristotle started his own school. This is the location where we think the school may have existed in Greece. We, of course, don't have any, um, it, it's no longer there. And just like Plato was moving away from the, uh, the, the kind of the democracy and the tyrants from the Peloponnesian War loss, Aristotle was kind of moving away from Plato because he said, you know, first of all, he got snubbed for the position at the head of the school, but then he also thought, but I want to study something different. Like, my focus is going to be different than, you know, just rationality and higher dimensions like Plato wants to talk about, think about. He said, I want to focus mainly on the physical world. So, in fact, Aristotle was even famous for walking around with his students. You know, so he would, there would have been typical, you know, classrooms, not too unlike what we have today. We have some historical records of them, ruins of what the classrooms would have looked like. But um, he also would have walked around with his students, pointing things out in the natural world as he's lecturing. You know, they would have gone through the woods and so forth, and he would have pointed things out and said, see, that's an example of this kind of soul. And that, you know, so he was very supposedly interactive in that way. He really wanted to emphasize the hands-on nature of knowledge that we have to go out and experiment. Again, father of science. Now, for all the good things I'm saying about Aristotle, and this is a lesson for all of us in the appeal to authority, uh, we have to remember that even great minds are not great about everything. And Aristotle came up with this theory of the universe that was believed for several thousand years. And as great as it was that Aristotle was respected, so we still have his philosophy, it was also bad in the sense that people respected him so much that they didn't question him. And if Socrates taught us anything, it's that we need to be able to question even those with authority. We shouldn't be afraid to ask questions. However, Aristotle creates this model of the universe that is wrong. Um, and when people start to question it, they're the ones who get attacked. They say, who are you to question the great Aristotle? Right. And this specifically happened with people like Copernicus and Galileo and the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church argued that, well, not only did God create us at the center of the universe and everything, but Aristotle also said so. Right? So they had Aristotle to back them up. And it made it that much harder for people like Galileo who said, guys, I still believe in God, but I think we're this thing, you know, revolving around the sun. And anyways, we know how all that went. But Aristotle's model is interesting, but it's wrong. He said, we're at the center, and the few planetary bodies they had observed, you know, Venus, Sun, Mars, and so forth, were revolving around us. And he also thought there were these vibrating spheres of different frequencies that corresponded to each of these planets, right? So just fanciful stuff, but wrong. Uh, so we should never forget that even the great Aristotle uh, could have been, can be wrong, can be questioned. He was still a human. Nevertheless, um, he comes up with this theory of naturalism. And let's look at naturalism for a minute here. So the basic belief, and this is a metaphysical view, right? Metaphysics, again, is about reality. And the basic core belief is that everything that exists, all of reality, is made up of the natural world. Everything we have here is made up of the natural world. And how do we know about that? Well, we can perceive it through the senses. So this anticipates a theory we'll talk about much later in the class called empiricism, which is a method for finding out the truth of the world by experiment. Aristotle's not quite there yet. He's just saying the world itself exists as it exists. It's only natural stuff. Now, I want to be clear what this suggests. If it's only natural is what exists, that means things like souls, ghosts, gods don't exist. Right? So naturalists, who also, by the way, very many scientists today consider themselves naturalists, they generally don't believe in any sort of supernatural higher, higher level um, being. 
or, or existence. It's just the natural world in front of us. Now, to be fair, there are some naturalists who will say, hey, look, I'm open-minded, and the instant that we find evidence for these other things, it will become part of the natural explanation. So, for instance, there, might, there would be some who would say, our science just hasn't advanced enough to understand, say, um, you know, multiple dimensions or um, some sort of mind over matter type of thing. And once our science advances, that will just become natural. Right? So there is that question. That's the way some naturalists see it. But in any case, Aristotle's a naturalist. And so for him, that's all we've got. We've got this natural world around us. Now, now let me just mention, let me just update naturalism because um, naturalists today uh, are not only open-minded often in the way I just mentioned, but it, it's, it's a much more sexy theory now, if you will. Um, and what I mean by that is that there are things now that we've observed like black holes and like parallel dimensions, or, or at least we've, we have some evidence for, and other planets and things like that. For a naturalist, that's all part of his world. That, it's not like that doesn't exist. Aliens could be part of a naturalist's world if they exist on this plane, on the physical plane. So in other words, whereas naturalism kind of seems like this very cold, oh, you don't believe in some higher realm of reality thing, it's not really like that because reality itself is so interesting. That's exactly what a naturalist would say. Reality itself is, is so amazing. Uh, and that's what most naturalists say. Because it's another argument people present against naturalism is, oh, you must have a really depressed life because this is the only life you think exists. You're not, you don't think you're going to go on to heaven. At first, the naturalist would obviously say, well, that's wishful thinking because you don't know if you're going on to heaven either, right? But he'd also say that uh, there's meaning on this world, right? There's meaning on this planet. Whether or not there's an afterlife, can you not still learn the classical guitar? Can you not still fall in love? Can you not still learn languages? Can you not still travel to Paris and to Argentina? Can you not still do amazing, amazing things? Can you not still watch the greatest movies that have ever been produced? Can you not still listen to amazing music? All of these things are possible in a naturalist worldview. So the naturalist basically says, um, there may not be any grand meaning, going back to the distinction I made before, but the naturalist nevertheless says, but there's plenty of meaning here on this planet, and that's good enough for me. So, so anyways, that's naturalism. Aristotle would have made a lot of those points, but, you know, minus the technological advances we've had. Uh, so, what about the forms, though? What about the forms? Aristotle wants to preserve Plato's philosophy, but does not believe that every single thing on this planet is a copy of or participating in some higher dimension of forms. But he still thinks the forms exist in some way. So what he then says instead is he says, well, there are these universals in nature or forms in nature, and we can call them essences. So everything has an essence. That's the universal, but it exists as part of the thing. Right? That's the difference. For Plato, the essence of something is up in this higher realm. For Aristotle, its essence is part of the thing itself. So for example, we're all different. We all have our own unique idiosyncrasies as humans, but we are universally human. We are the same in that we share, as it's sometimes put, humanness. We are all human. We share that universal. It's not in some higher dimension. It's part of us, but we're, it's nevertheless there. There's many different types of pencils, all with different variations. They all share the concept or the universal of pencilness and cowness and cameraness and coffeeness and so forth. So notice it's the same idea. Everything has a form, but the forms are here down on this earth, fitting perfectly in with Aristotle's philosophy of naturalism that the natural world is all that exists. And by the way, notice the way he's being very, what we would consider scientist-like today in observing the world and cutting up different processes, right? He's saying he's, he grounds all his observations and his deductive reasoning in what's really a, he's observing around him. Another one of his great contributions is this idea of causality and teleology. Remember, teleology is the study of purpose. For Aristotle, 
everything's moving towards this ultimate goal or end, and it's moving towards a purpose. Now, he makes a distinction that we still have today, actually, uh, between potential and actual. He makes a distinction between um, potential purpose and actual purpose. So, for, exa for example, you have the oak tree that has the potential, I'm sorry, you have the acorn that has the potential to become the oak tree, but it's not actually, it doesn't actually realize itself until it does become the oak tree. Right? So everything we observe has the potential to become this greater thing, but it can be thwarted or stopped in its causal path. Right? Unfortunately, people who are young die and they don't reach their full potential. Uh, plants die before they're fully grown and so forth. Um, so there is, for him, there's that difference though between potential and actual. Now, he actually creates four stages of causes. And he says, if we're gonna try to explain something, we need to understand these four different um, aspects of its causal nature. And so Aristotle first says that if we're trying to explain something, to explain a cause and an effect relationship, we need to first understand the material cause. In other words, what is the thing literally composed out of? Is it wood? Is it, you know, molecule? Is it air molecules? Is it tin? What, what's the thing made of? The formal cause is the second thing we have to consider, which is what is it shaped into? How, what is the form of the thing? If it's made of wood, is it shaped like a guitar or is it shaped like a chair? And the efficient cause, and this is the way we normally understand cause today, but Aristotle included it as one among the four. The efficient cause is the triggering event, the thing that triggers it into existence. If it's the chair, it's the dude who built the chair. If it's a car, it's the assembly line of workers that built the car. If it's an artwork, it's the artist who painted that art or produced it. Uh, so the efficient cause is the triggering event of the thing. If it's you, it's your parents who caused you, just like me. The final cause though, and this is the most elusive one, is the ultimate goal or purpose. And this is where you can see the teleology part. So for Aristotle, everything's moving towards its ultimate goal and purpose. It has this various potential and it may or may not get there. It may or may not reach that end goal, uh, that final cause. And the final cause can be obvious in some cases. So let me just let me let's just take the example of uh, of a guitar. Um, you have the formal cause, which w I'm sorry, the material cause, which would be the wood and the strings and the you know the steel and whatever it's made of. You'd have the formal cause, which is the shape of the guitar. And then you'd have the efficient cause, which is depending on how the guitar was produced. Was it an individually designed guitar, like from Martin or something, or was it a mass-produced guitar at Walmart? Uh, whichever one is the one, that's the thing. And then it seems fairly obvious that for any guitar, the purpose is to be played. We don't have to go into, you're gonna play it at a concert, you're gonna play it at home, you're gonna play it, to, it's to be played. That's why you get a guitar. Now to be fair, there might be some guitars that are collector's items, like say, one that was autographed by Jimi Hendrix or something. And that purpose would be to, to be displayed, not to be played. Right? So uh, the purpose can depend, you know, can come from the person who made it. But in, in, ter in terms of just a guitar you buy at the store, it's obviously to be played. That's the purpose. Right? There's nothing fancy, fancy there. With humans, though, that's where it gets sticky. That's where it gets complicated. What is the final purpose of a human being? And, and you might just say, well, it's just to reproduce. Right? But then, is our purpose the same as a dog? Because that's you could say that's the purpose of a dog, uh, or you know, a mouse or something. I mean, are, is our purpose the same as animals? Aristotle didn't think so. He thought humans were different and that we had more potential. So, uh, you know, the potential we have, the ability to become or to actualize ourselves, is much broader than say the potential that a plant has to realize itself or the potential that a rat has and so forth. Um, now, I want to mention one other thing about purpose. Because, like, I, like I've been saying, Aristotle sees purpose everywhere. But we're going to address a philosophy later in the class, much later, and we'll somewhat touch on this when we get to God. 
And that's the question of, is there purpose, really? Is there even purpose at all? Uh, or is it kind of just in our heads? Right? Is Ar all the stuff Aristotle crea Aristotle's creating here about purpose, is that something that's just kind of he's projecting onto the universe? Is there really no purpose and it's just human purpose that we put out there? Well, this view that there isn't any purpose is sometimes known as nihilism or nihilism. And um, uh, there's whole schools of philosophy that have built up around that, that there isn't a purpose. So we will see a historical challenge to Aristotle's idea of purpose later. We will also address purpose when we deal with an argument called the argument by design for God, which suggests that the purpose comes not from the universe itself, as Aristotle thinks, but the purpose comes from God. So this question of whether we have a purpose is a huge one. Obviously, it matters a lot. I mean, it could change your whole life if you thought we had a purpose and then we don't, uh, or vice versa. So anyways, Aristotle thinks there's a purpose, but there's a lot of people who don't, and we'll get there later. And I just want to give you one example of how difficult it can be sometimes to figure out if there's a purpose. So one, of, one famous example is this monument off the coast of Japan underwater in the ocean. And uh, it's called the Yonaguni Monument. And historians, it, archaeologists seem to be split here over whether or not this place had a purpose. Is it just some rocks that were randomly formed by natural processes that happened to look like they had design? Because notice how there's those sharp edges and so forth. It looks like it could have been an ancient city. Um, you know, but or was it just a natural process or was it really some sort of an ancient city or civilization? I mean, it could be. Those things look pretty well designed. But again, it's we don't know. It could it could have just been formed that way by nature. We obviously know examples of, you know, people seeing purpose where it's not there. You know, whether it's you think your boyfriend or girlfriend's cheating on you when they're really not, or whether it's you thinking that you've seen a face on Mars just because there's a few things that look like eyeballs, you know, a few craters that are, happen to be put in the right configuration. So the problem with purpose is that there's an argument to be made that we want to see purpose. Go back to the confirmation bias. If you believe something, you see it everywhere. If you believe it in God, if you believe in God, you see every good thing as somehow being God's work. If you don't believe in God, you see every bad thing as being evidence against God's existence. So we have to filter to modernize Aristotle. We have to filter our understanding of purpose through the idea that maybe sometimes we're seeing purpose that ain't there. Uh, not coming down on either side there. Just throwing out that debate about um, does it have a purpose, does it not? We know what Aristotle thinks. So just a couple more things here on Aristotle. And um, by the way, we're going to come back. I'm going to come back soon to the idea of uh, purpose in humans and final cause uh, of a human being soon. That eudaimonia thing I had mentioned before. Now let's look at Aristotle's concept of soul. So again, I want to point out how much, how, how very much, how very scientific this is to use our modern terminology. Aristotle is sitting here and pointing at different parts of nature and different processes and dividing them up into different rules that they obey. And that's exactly what scientists do today. They try to observe nature and extract some sort of principle or property or theory from it and work from that. And Aristotle was doing that here. So when he looks at nature, and these are the sorts of things he was probably pointing out to his students as they walked around. He would have said, see that worm? That's an example of a vegetative soul. Uh, and a vegetative soul is the soul of something that just absorbs the environment. It does not have senses. It just absorbs and gets rid of it. It usually has a short lifespan. Um, if Aristotle had known about them, he would have included things like amoebas and small bacteria, probably as part of um, the vegetative soul. So in any case, he observes a lot of small things like that and insects along that, that level that uh, absorb the environment. Although not every insect would be vegetative. You know, some of the more complex insects, like a spider, would be more sensitive. Uh, and the sensitive soul is the next stage up. And remember, like I mentioned before, for Aristotle, this is a hierarchy, you know, where one is greater than the other, but contains the previous. So in other words, the rational soul is its own thing but it also contains the sensitive and vegetative soul. 
And the sensitive soul is its own thing, but it also contains the vegetative soul. But the vegetative soul, being at the bottom of the hierarchy, only contains itself, if that makes sense. So in other words, humans sense the environment and they absorb the environment, but they are also aware of the environment. And this is the major difference that Aristotle sees here between humans and animals. Because he says, look, animals are fully aware of their environment in the sense that they can sense what needs to be done for survival. Uh, you know, the lion can sense the gazelle and knows what it needs to, to, to kill it and eat it so that it can survive. Uh, but a lion, Aristotle argued, is not aware of its self. It doesn't have this level of sort of self-awareness and of itself in the environment. Human beings can be aware of themselves in the environment, uh, and animals cannot, Aristotle argued. Uh, so this is very interesting to me because it raises a deep issue of the connection between humans and animals. And I took a class in grad school called Animal Minds, which is very fascinating. And one of the deep questions we had was, is the difference between animals one of degree or one of kind? What that means is, is there a foot, like, are, are we categorically different from animals? Right? Are we completely different beings entirely? Even if, we're, even if we're all animals on some level, are we so different as to be classified differently? Or if it's a matter of degree, are we just more sophisticated? So whereas animals like, say, orcas and dolphins have a basic language, and monkeys, they have a basic language, it's not as advanced as ours. Well, more evidence seems to be pointing to the difference in degree, because even something like morality that Aristotle would have certainly said was a part of human beings, human beings can know what's right and wrong, there is evidence of basic morality in ape and monkey societies uh, you know, even evidence of things like fairness and justice. Um, so, again, not coming down on either side here, I think it's fascinating. Uh, but where Aristotle came down was we are different, humans are superior, we are higher up on the hierarchy, but there's an argument to be made that maybe it's not that simple. Maybe it's more of a continuum between these, these uh, uh, different levels of being, if you will, levels of existence. So, in any case, human beings, being the superior moral beings that we are, Aristotle would have said, we can understand right from wrong, where dogs and cats and uh, tigers and whatnot can't, he would have argued. And he would have said, this is what leads us to have much more potential. And what leads us to what he calls eudaimonia. Now, before I get into the, de the details of eudaimonia, I think I'm just going to throw this free write up on the, up on the um, like I said, I don't always put the free writes up. This one I think is worth reflecting upon. And obviously you don't have to actually write anything, but maybe think to yourself, what would it mean for you to be fully realized, right? to, to, be, to reach your full potential? You're certainly aware of things that you're good at and things you're bad at. Right? Maybe you're really good at piano, you're not so good at math. Maybe you're really good at math, you're not so good at writing, whatever it is. If you could really hone and develop some part of your life to become realized in it, what would it look like? How, how would your life look if you were all in all fully realized? Would that mean you'd have kids and a family, you know, grandchildren when you're older? W would that mean you wouldn't be married and you'd just be kind of, you know, the George Clooney bachelor type, although I think he got married eventually? Um, what would your full realization look like? So after you've reflected on that, let's look at Aristotle's idea of eudaimonia. So I want to emphasize again, as I said at the beginning of the lecture, Aristotle's talking about a complex process that happens continually throughout your life. You don't just reach a point and say, ah, here I am. I'm, I reached eudaimonia. I'm happy. Done. Right? You don't, there's not a drop of the mic moment where suddenly you become happy. And I think, actually, this is a major source of confusion in our culture, that we believe happiness will come that way. We often build our life around those false desires that once this occurs, then I'm going to be happy. Once I get the girlfriend, or the boyfriend, or the significant other, then I'll be happy. You get the significant other, you're not happy. Okay, well, I guess it's just I really need to be on the right path in my career. 
okay, go to school, get your degree, get your job, not happy. This is why people have midlife crises, because they follow the wrong part of happiness. So Aristotle is trying to help us here. He's trying to say, look, it's not about a temporary goal. It's about finding a life where you can be your best self, where it's about finding a life in an environment and putting yourself there where you feel every day like you want to wake up and you feel like, you know, like a kid on Christmas morning every day for the most part, where that's what you want. Now, now again, I want to be clear, though, that doesn't mean that there won't be periods of time that you go through suffering. So this is another, you know, I'm giving a lot of my opinions here, but this is another problem with our culture is that we want to band-aid problems. We want to take a pill to solve everything. We want to watch a YouTube video to understand philosophy in five minutes, and it just ain't going to happen. It's sometimes you got to work at something. You have to go through struggle to really learn and grow. And Aristotle appreciated that. He said, a good life, a fully realized life, may very well include long periods of depression in which a person struggles to become better. Right? That's part of it. In fact, a, what, what might seem like a fully realized life might not be at all. If a person is never challenging themselves and never really you know, putting themselves out there so that they can experience pain to grow from it, but they're just seeking comfort, it might seem like they're contented, but they actually haven't developed themselves as far as they could go. At least Aristotle would say. Now, I have this picture of Jeff Bridges on the right there, a famous actor, and that's a movie called The Big Lebowski, which is from 96, I believe, a long time ago now. And I'm sure some of you have heard of it or seen it. The reason I put that there is because there's a point at the beginning of the movie, I think. By the way, if you haven't seen it, it's a Coen Brothers movie, very well done, appreciated by fans and critics alike. Um, and there's a scene at the beginning I believe, I think it's fairly towards the beginning, and there's voiceover in the movie. And there's a voiceover, and the guy, the voiceover is kind of talking about this guy, Jeff Bridges, the actor, that's the actor's name. In the movie, he's just called the dude. And uh, basically he says, look, sometimes there's a guy who's just right for his time and place. He fits right in there, and he's just, you know, he was born into the right area, and he fits, it, it, he just fits like a puzzle piece into a particular part of history. He just, he's just there. Um, he's just, you know, it, 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 he's gotta be there. He's the right, he's in the right place and the right time for being alive. Now notice the contrast to that, how some people feel like they are in the wrong place. They say, look, I'm not connected to the people around here. I don't agree with what they're talking about. I feel out of touch. And then they'll often move somewhere and they'll feel more connected. So. Aristotle would, of course, said, hey, move if you got to move. You know, if you're not fully, fully realized where you are, get out of that situation. But anyways, in that movie, The Big Lebowski, Jeff Bridges is, is like, he's sort of like the living example of eudaimonia. He's right in this, you know, perfect spot. And it's kind of interesting because from the outside, you might call, some might call him a loser. He's an old dude, really without a job. He's late on his rent, smokes a lot of pot. Um, but he's he's happy and realized in his in his situation, and that's what matters most. Now, Aristotle did say that the process of eudaimonia can be more likely given certain circumstances, and I just named some. Like being born into the wrong place is a major impediment. Uh, you know, it, this happens to people a lot. You, I had a friend who completely ditched his family in the Midwest. He just he couldn't handle it anymore and he just moved away and cut all ties and he, he was much happier when he came out um, to San Diego uh, but Aristotle said he, he said it, it, let me be clear what he's saying here he's not saying these characteristics in that first bullet point are guarantee you're happy or unhappy or you reach full potential or not rather he's saying that it's more likely that if you have these things going for you that you're more likely to reach eudaimonia so for instance, some, there's some, something to be said about luck. If you just happen to grow up in the right family that shares the values that you want to believe, that you come to love, then you're lucky. Uh, maybe you're born in an area where you don't have to worry about health or, um, you know, there are some, even to this day, there are people who are born in places where there are drug-addled soldiers who want to, you know, who are going around raping people. Uh, so you might you might have luck in terms of where you're born and then also you might have the luck of being born into a wealthy family 
So Aristotle acknowledged, hey, look, if you got a lot of money, it's easier to have that freedom and maneuverability to pursue what you want to pursue. You know, when Paris Hilton made her albums, I think it was probably a lot easier that she was already a rich girl. Sorry for the judgment, but... Um, so that now, now this is the one the next one is the one that causes people the most anger at aristotle here he says actually if you're better looking you're more likely to succeed uh i think aristotle's a little bit wrong here too I, I, because i think first of all i mean we know to a large degree looks are in the eyes of the beholder and also cultures have different understandings of what good looking is if you go to china the concept of beauty in a woman is very different than the concept of beauty in a woman in america for example uh, and for men, too, right? In Korea versus China, there's differences in conceptions of beauty. But I think if we're trying to defend Aristotle here, what he's saying is whatever your culture, whatever conception they have of beauty, if you fit that conception, you're more likely to be happy because you're going to have people looking at you if you're a woman, you're going to have people interested in you if you're a man, you're going to have women interested in you and so forth. That's going to you know, make you happier to have that attention from others and it's going to make it more likely that you feel good about yourself, says Aristotle. And of course, you know, if you're born with a terrible debilitating disease or, you know, you have to constantly be in the hospital, it's going to make it also harder for you to fully realize, uh, realize who you are. Now, I want to emphasize again, even though Aristotle says these factors are likely to make you reach your full potential, he's not saying that you need them. He's not saying that they absolutely have to be there. And Socrates would be a perfect example. Socrates was actually said not to be the most good-looking guy because his inner beauty shone forth. So people would meet him and think that he was kind of unremarkable in appearance. But then they'd talk to Socrates for a few minutes and they'd, his inner beauty would just take them over. Um, so Socrates clearly had reached eudaimonia. He was fully realized. And, you know, he didn't wasn't the best-looking dude. So... I think, you know, we got to remember Aristotle saying these are conditions that are likely to lead to eudaimonia, not guaranteed. Okay, folks, um, that's going to wrap up my discussion of Aristotle and all the Greek philosophers. So, like I said, lots of sources in the reader. Um, please ask me if you have any more questions. I did not do justice to their full philosophies, but I did give you some of their central um, points. And what I hope you saw the most was the interplay between the ideas and how one was responding to the other. And that interplay will continue as we continue in the class.